if God were to send his prophet to speak about the state of marriage in our nation today, what would he say? I am Pastor Ken Larson. I'm the visitation pastor. Happy to be back visiting the people of Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. We invite you to worship with us on Sunday at 8.30 or 10.30, and you can also do it online by going to YouTube or trinitydelray.org slash live. Our Bible study comes to you unless you're in our Zoom recording on Saturdays. You can watch it on Sunday at 9.30 or any time thereafter. Kind of like they say, on demand, and I hope you will. We're studying the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. After Malachi comes what book? Uh, Matthew. Matthew, thank you. Malachi speaks in the second chapter about marriage. Marriage is a gift of God, but many people of our nation regard marriage as a burden to be avoided or even voided. They show contempt for marriage and refuse to repent of their sins against God. So we're in Malachi chapter 2. We started it last week. And the subject of chapter 2, the second part of chapter 2, is marriage and divorce. And I want to start at the beginning. Is that a good place to start? Sounds like the sound of music, do re mi. No, I have something else, because in the beginning, after creating the man, named Adam, which means man, the Lord God said it is not good that the man should be alone. And at this point, all husbands should say amen. <laughs> but seriously, really, really seriously, there is something that I want to give to you today that's different. And it goes like this. Let me know if you the don't. Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. Can you hear that? Yes. yes. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. I think you know Genesis chapter 2 very well. You know it because it is foundational for the establishment of marriage. We didn't invent marriage. Marriage was a gift of God because he knew, <laughs> and we have found out that it is not good for a man to be alone. Uh, would you like to comment on Genesis chapter two before we go on? I think it's pretty straightforward. Even in science, I think it's pretty straightforward. I mean, they look at DNA and of course the scientists that are messing around with uh, genealogy, they know they have been able to form um, hearts and other organs and things from, uh, from, pre from cells from, other, from, from a heart or you know, those types of things. So, so I, so I think when they said, you know, bone to bone and that there was DNA there, you know, I, 
it's, it's, I think it's really hard to not believe it. That's right. And this is the foundation of marriage. A man shall leave his father and his mother. And hold fast to his wife. Another translation says, um, cling to his wife. And a man did a sermon on this text many years ago, and he called it leaving and cleaving. Cleaving uh -huh. and what? Pleading? Leaving and leaving cleaving. And cleaving. He shall Pleading. leave to his oh, I wife. I thought you said pleading with a P, pleading well, after we, he we left do, his chair. So. We do that too, but I'm not <laughs> going to discuss that this morning. No. <laughs> so continuing with the questions numbered as they were from last week, um, we didn't finish it. In what ways does our American culture show contempt for the estate of marriage? Why is staying together till death so difficult? Your responses, please. Anyone? I guess I guess just I just the sin of the world s i n because there is sin and it's become so rampant in our world um, and I think some of it is because we have seen religion uh, decrease in percentages and people believing in faith in uh, our God as we know him mm -hmm. and therefore are coming up with all sorts of things idols basically that meet meet their needs you know it's okay if i marry another woman or it's okay if two men marry or all but of these not. arrangements but it's not no yeah. it's not but yeah. they they start believing the world says it's okay and so right. therefore you know and then and then as human beings we're starting to make laws that make it okay as as we interfere and we sin more and more and more and it just keeps building unfortunately it's also i think the um the me 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 um of our the generations uh -huh. um it, it's what makes me happy if you're not going to make right. me happy then i'm not going to stay with you yeah you know so they they don't they they come to that realization to that to that um way of thinking because they want things to be their way they want to do what they want to do they're not thinking about working together as a unit. They're thinking selfishly just of themselves. That's true. And I think as Christians, we might sometimes think when you get married, everything is going to be perfect and hunky-dory. <laughs> uh, you know, all of a sudden, oh, it's going to be so wonderful and romantic. Well, I think we all have found out it's not always that way. You know, and uh, some things, uh, of course, we know we can work out and some things we know can't be worked out because they have sinned against God and there is a legitimate reason. But in many, in many uh, respects, we sometimes give up too easy because of like Jamie said, the me, 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 I, you know, you aren't making me happy or you aren't buying me the big house I wanted or whatever it is. Materialism. And, yes. Right. There are many gods and uh, uh, it is not my intent, I want your responses, of course, but I, it's not my intent to study the topic of marriage in detail. Uh, but Malachi brings it up because of the sin of the nation, of, uh, and uh, they were, re let's, let's get into it, into the text. But first, I want to give you some rather recent statistics. This is from a survey from 2019. All right, uh, roughly 50% of first marriages fail, around 60% of second marriages, and a whopping 73% of third marriages. I'm not a sociologist, so I won't comment on, uh, on what's going on there. I'm just giving you the stats. Divorce rate, almost 15 per 1,000. Now that is uh, a survey that's subject to interpretation because of the way it's done. And I'm not, again, I'm not a statistician. I'm just reporting to you that we're, we're having about 15 divorces per 1,000 marriages, regardless of whether it's first, second, third, or 
forth. But it was surprising to me to learn, and maybe you're surprised also, to learn that that rate is the lowest since 1970. I thought it was going up. And I'll tell you why I think it's going down. More and more are living together without being married. And that means when they separate, there is no divorce. So that stat of them separating is not in, in those numbers. Right. So since 1970, you see, we have sinned as a nation in another way. The off-sided adage that half of the marriages fail is really based on inaccurate data. And the way they do uh, the surveys changes the numbers. All right, some more stats. No-fault divorce laws in many states and divorce kits that you can order by mail. You see these little signs along the side of the road. Divorce, $75. <laughs> well, that makes it very easy to uh, draw up a piece of paper. Uh, Pastor, what are they considering marriage between a man and a woman or all the other well, marriages that are being accepted? I, I don't know. Okay, so that's a variant we don't know. Right. I, it wasn't mentioned in the survey. Okay. The baby boomers tend to marry younger, and some say that that could be a factor, and they weren't mature enough, perhaps, to take on the giving up of self and loving the other one. Uh, single and happy. Now, this is the stat that I was referring to. In 1960, 68% of 20-somethings were married. In 2008, only 26% of that age group were married. I'm not gonna comment anymore, but this tells us that divorce in America is rampant and uh, the sins of the nation uh, of Israel, I really should say Judah at that point, uh, ha We've been, we're repeating it. We're repeating it in some way. And one poll, four out of 10 respondents said, marriage is obsolete. <laughs> well, you see why, because you can do what you want. Question eight, I'm gonna go on before we spend too much time on stats. What do the scriptures teach about divorce? God says in Malachi 2.16, I hate divorce. And another way of translating that is, I hate putting away. Now, you recall the dialogue between Jesus and the Pharisees when they said, Moses said it was all right to put away your wife. And Jesus' answer was, that was because of the hardness of your hearts. Because you wouldn't honor marriage, there was nothing else that could be done. All right, so that's what the scriptures say about divorce. Now, there are many ways to cause a divorce, and I'm not going to talk about it in detail. Sometimes both parties are guilty. Sometimes only one party is guilty. Is guilty. But that's all I'm going to say about that this morning. I want to go to question nine. How can we best encourage young people to marry with an intent an intent to remain married till death do us part. What would you like to see in your grandchildren's marriages, or maybe I should say your great grandchildren's marriages? Well, I if if I was older, I would just I would say I would just say that exact same thing. Just put it in their mind. Just put it in their mind that you gotta have true love and true love usually means till death do us part unless uh -huh. one of those unless if it's like a pity something some type of problem breaks out but like that i i would just say tell them get just stick them with the intent intent to remain married till death do us part yeah you said first to put it in your heart that's a it's a holy intent isn't it mm -hmm. yeah see this is what i want mm. I no, I'll repeat a story. Someone else, please. I would, so I would also add that um, 
Um, I think people tend to get married too quickly. They don't get to know each other. <laughs> you know, there used to be a long, what they called courting period. And you, that way you got to know the other person, you got to know their family. It, there was interactions. You knew what you were getting into. You, you were able to discuss many things over a period of time and to find out whether or not you would be a good match for each other. I think people tend to rush into things too quickly. And that's what I would encourage younger people to do. All right, thank you. Ian, we um, appreciate your contribution too. Who else wants to talk? I would, I would say I'd certainly hope and pray that they had some sort of a faith-based background yeah. uh -huh. to cling on to also. And I know pastors in their premarital teaching do do some of what, like Jamie said, you know, they will, um, I don't know if they do like a little, um, a, a I don't want to use the word test, but basically, you know, find out what they think about certain things. And uh, finances become a real big thing in a marriage. Oh, and yeah. some of the, you know, and what do they think about faith, I guess, especially if they come from different backgrounds in faith. And yeah. like Jamie said, get all those things out in the open air ahead of time. You know, uh, and and of course, like Ian said, love is really important. Um, but sometimes it doesn't overcome everything, unfortunately. It depends uh, upon how what what type of love we're we're speaking of, also. So, if it's love of Christ, you can work through a lot of things. Absolutely, and there are three words for love in the, in the Bible, and we could discuss that at another time. This is a very rich load, L-O-D-E, which we could mine, M-I-N-E, but uh, not today. I, I think marriage is, huh, don't get me started. I, uh, I think it's one of God's greatest gifts. So that's, we are idealists, we're idealists until we get married and then we become realists because the only kind of person that I can ever marry is another sinner. Right? That's true in this world. And that other sinner has a sin of self, uh, though I must say for my record that Jeannie has less love of self than her husband. Now, that's all we're going to say about that today. So we get in Malachi chapter 2, verse 10. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Jamie to read this morning. Okay. Have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another? profaning the covenant of our fathers. Well, the covenant he's talking about is the covenant of marriage. The covenant of marriage was that the Israelites remain separate. They were not to intermarry with the heathen nations, with any of the Canaanites and the Jebusites and the Hittites and all the rest. And there was a reason for that, right? Why was, uh, why was that so? They were not to intermarry. Because they didn't want to bring in their uh, uh, worship of idols and other gods. Absolutely correct. Uh, Ian, are you, uh, are you able and willing to read what's on the screen from Exodus 34? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, Exodus 34. 34, 16. And when you choose some of their daughters as wives, for your sons and those daughters prostitute themselves to their gods, they will lead your sons to do the same. Yeah. And that happened. And that was one of the reasons that the Israelites, uh, and then when uh, Israel was gone and it was only Judah, the two tribes that were left, they continued the idolatrous ways that were brought in by the non-Jewish spouses. Okay, it could happen either way. So that was the problem. So 
we want to bring it back to our day. What kinds of problems can occur when a Christian marries an unbeliever? Um, well, that that grudge can be a, like um, that grudge can be a, a huge a huge part for the marriage. That's one thing. Yes, it's, um, when sometimes, especially when children are born, it can create uh, problems as to which religion, if there are two religions, there uh, are they going to be raised in and. Uh, some religions are really strong about that, and you know it's, it may start tearing the family apart at that age if some of that has not, I guess, been discussed ahead of time. No, and no. even when it's discussed ahead of time, things can change. Minds can change. Okay. Many of the marriage ceremonies that I officiated at during my uh, active ministry at uh, Redeemer in West Palm, one of the members of the wedding party was not a believer. And we had premarital counseling and we talked about the differences and the different values that each held. And I think the idealism of uh, we want to get married anyway overruled any cautions that I might have given them. There are some denominations in America, I believe this still is true, that will not officiate, they will not allow a marriage in the church when one of the, one, the man or the woman is not a believer. I told you the story of my good friend, uh, Dale, and, um, I'm not going to retell the story now, uh, but uh, God did a wonderful thing in that marriage. All kinds of problems, different values and so forth. Can a marriage still work when one partner takes faith seriously and the other shows disinterest even in going to worship? Yes, it can. I mean, God can work miracles and... and uh... You know, there are marriages in which that does work. And like you said, sometimes it can bring the miracle of bringing the other partner even to Christ. Yes. I'm, I'm not going to put it on the screen, but if you want to write this down, you can look at 1 Peter chapter 3, one of my favorite places to go when we're talking about the marriage of a believer and an unbeliever. You can also read in 1 Corinthians 6, and especially 1 Corinthians 7. Those are three references I'm giving you. 1 Peter 3, 1 Corinthians 6, and 1 Corinthians 7. I'm not giving you the verses. You're going to have to use your eyes to go and find the pertinent passages. But uh, that's, a, that's a, a deep study, and it would require a couple of hours for us to go there today, and I'm not going to do that. But it probably, can a marriage still work? It probably defend, depends on that couple's definition of the word work. <laughs> All right. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the weasel word. That last question of yours, another thing that really lays heavy on my heart is today we're hearing a lot of, um, well, even sometimes Christians or there's two different religions they're allowing the children to decide when they get older what they want to believe and what religion they might want to choose, if they want to choose any at all. And that really, I find, I really find that difficult um, with no bringing up of values or anything. At least that's where I feel a lot of our values and all come out of is our upbringing in a Christian faith. Yes. If, uh, for, if uh, Ephesians, uh, six one to four teaches us that you are to bring your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and you're not likely to do that if you have two different lords. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about. All right, let's go on. I tend to get so bound up in um, in a tangent that um, I'm sort of pushing it. I want another reader, please. Um, Judy, you haven't read today. Malachi 2, verse 11. 
Uh, Judah had been faithless and ad, 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 admit, uh, abomination. abomination, abomination, thank you, has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judea has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. Ooh, I'm That's pretty direct. There. Cut off. What problem does the Lord raise in verse 11? Marrying daughters of who, who, uh, who don't, who believe in other gods. There are many gods, but there is only one Lord. Yeah. And the Lord God who gave the gift of marriage to all people, wants everyone to worship him and him alone. And when you marry into another religion where the God they worship is not the Lord God, the Lord God of the Old Testament, the creating God, the promising God, and the same Lord who is Lord of all, who is more beautifully, more fully revealed in the New Testament, he is the Lord who sent his son into the world to redeem all of the sinners, whether they're married or not. You see, and he is the Lord God and the only one that we should worship. It is a definite thing and you don't get to choose. There's <laughs> well, if you choose wrong, you, I hate to say the word lose there, but you choose wrong, you lose. What is the penalty in verse 12? You get cut off from the Lord. You're being cut off. It's, it's an expulsion yeah. from fellowship with all of the people of God. You no longer belong. You are removed. You are not considered one of God's people. To be cut off, I won't call it excommunication, though there is a similarity there, but they can no longer worship. Uh, when they bring an offering, if they would ever do that kind of a thing, their offering would be refused. And that's why at the end of this chapter, there is weeping in some of the tents because God is refusing their, offer, their offering. Well, in the Jewish uh, tradition, when um, a, a, a Jewish person uh, does something while still living, may step away from the religion or does something against it. I know family members will tear, actually tear their um, clothing. And right. it symbolizes that they are, that person that left the religion is now dead. They have no association whatsoever. They right. treat them as if they're dead. That's what we're talking about when we say cut off. cut off. So here's the question that is pertinent to 2021. Do you believe it is still important to marry someone committed to the same faith, the same beliefs? Anyone? Yes, I, I believe so. I believe you should have, I believe to have the same faith. I mean, like, I, I'm. I'm going to push the Christian, like both Christians, because faith is something that can bring a couple together. And if you have two different ones in a marriage, that's, that's something that can create the big divide. And that's, that's something you don't need really in a marriage. And if you have faith, and if you both have the same faith, then that can be something you do like every Sunday. You go worship with your kids, go worship, um, and and that can be something that can bring, like, just make you guys happy, which uh, you need happiness in a marriage, and that can make you um, happy. Uh, that is a beautiful witness, Ian. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, to have, you know, if we could take every 12 year old and, and mold them by our Christian schools, like Trinity Lutheran School and mold them to that same conviction. We would make a big dent in the problems that we have. 
Now you're going to have problems in a marriage anyway. Mm -hmm. But we're saying, why, why add one more problem? And as you said, here's something that can bring you together. I don't know if you remember something, a bumper sticker that you haven't seen for a long time. Maybe you have, I haven't. Um, the family that prays that together. Prays together prays stays together. together. Yeah. 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 And one of the reasons is that it's very difficult to pray with someone and you haven't forgiven them. <laughs> It's very, <laughs> you're, it's very difficult. Okay. And another reader, someone who has, uh, hasn't read today. Who else is on, on here? Here, I'll jump on it here. Okay. I got well, a little background. There are two slides. This, so keep going. Okay. Chapter two in the second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because he's no longer regards... He no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless. That's as far as I can see on my screen. Okay. Just, here we go. Keep going. Uh, did not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their youth? And what was the one God seeking? Godly's offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let your, none of your let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord the God of Israel, covers his garment. And I can't read the next line. It covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not be faithless. Okay, I'm sorry that it's not on your screen. I don't know what causes that. So I want you to look again at verse 14. Go ahead and read it again, please, Bobby. Can you see that? Uh, 12, looking at, all right. The Lord was witness between you and wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. The Lord was witness. You know, when we have a wedding, whether it's in the church or on the beach or in a country club, it doesn't matter. I want the marriage in, a, <laughs> in the church. But the, be, being married in the church does not make it better, but it does kind of provide the mood, the, the sanctuary where holy things are done and said. Uh, people tend to be quieter and more reverent inside of a church but the lord god did not command that marriage happen in a church building i don't think you can read the bible from cover to cover i don't think you're going to find that so what i'm getting to is that the lord was a witness when the man and the woman stand before the altar they make each of them makes two vows the first vow is to each other to be faithful to each other and to care, love, honor, obey, and revere. Okay. And the second vow they make is to God. I think I have those reversed. Well, they make two vows, and the second vow is to the Lord. And the Lord is witness, even if there's nobody else there. Don't go there. But we have human witnesses. And even if the wedding party only consists of four people and the pastor, we have enough because the couple is there and each of them has a witness. And uh, the state of, of Florida and most other states, I believe, have two blank lines on the marriage certificate that comes from the county. And um, we immediately have those two witnesses sign of course if it is before the congregation or 200 people with friends and family we have a lot of witnesses <laughs> they can't say later on well we really didn't get married you understand why we have witnesses 
Well, the Lord is also a witness between you and the wife of your youth. He heard your promises to him and to each other. But Malachi, the prophet, is speaking God's word. And the Lord is saying, I was a witness to whom you have been faithless. You have been unfaithful to the wife of your youth. Because what the people of Judah were doing, the man would put away the wife of his youth, another Israelite, and he would marry a foreign god. I mean, a foreign a woman who worshipped a foreign god. And their faithlessness was double. One, they broke the marriage covenant. And number two, they began to worship false gods. Even though, I'm going to go on with the verse, she is your companion and your wife by covenant. And that's here, the covenant of marriage, the promise. And God established that covenant in Genesis chapter 2, as we heard and read this morning. Okay? So you see that marriage is not something that can be cast away because society has decided it's irrelevant or obsolete or old-fashioned or anything like that. It's necessary for God's order in the world, even among unbelievers. You understand that if two unbelievers marry, the covenant still exists. They made the promise, the same promises. Well, maybe they didn't make the same promises. You want to comment on that? Right. Well, they couldn't have made the same promises uh, because, yeah. uh, I mean, they made a might have made promises to each other yeah. but if they're not having faith then they don't believe in god so they didn't make a covenant with god yes yes that, that, that's correct so they would put away marriage very easily because i don't want to be bound as the song goes from the 60s or 70s, I don't want to be bound by some ink stains on paper. Oh. Anybody want to comment? This is, a, this is a long shot question. Even though um, they don't believe in God, I'm sure, you know, God wants everybody to be with him. Um, does he not hear that commitment that they make to one another and hopefully down the road that a miracle could happen in that marriage that they could come to Christ, which we have seen couples yeah, right. come, come to Christ. Yeah. I guess, so, I guess it would be saying he's chosen them. They just don't realize it yet. <laughs> yes. And he heard since God hears everything and knows yeah. everything. Yes. That's what I, that's what I mean. He know he knows everything and he knows what's going to happen in their lives before, well, before we're even born, he knows yeah. Um, and, you know, there is that possibility that some... That's right. And what happens in some of those marriages is that they have a recommitment. They have another ceremony in which uh, they make the godly promises that they left out. Mm -hmm. That happens. And sometimes they become really strong witnesses. I mean, they may even become involved in, you know, marriage conferences and counseling because of what has happened in their life, faith-based type right. of things. So what's God's view of this covenant between a man and a woman? What would God, how would God explain it or describe it or enforce it? Well, he thinks, I believe that he feels that it's, uh, it's not to be broken. That covenant is to remain forever. It's not something you can just say, okay, I'm not going to do it today. Yeah. Marriage is a, is a constant thing. I am far from a perfect husband. And uh, I think Jeannie would admit to some failings. I won't speak of her that she's not here to defend herself. But 
we've got a good thing going. And if I'm not the happiest man in the world, I'm one of the happiest men in the world because of what God gave us. I came from a broken home, as I've explained to you. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going into detail today, but I could see at a young age, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And back to what Ian said earlier, I had an intent. I didn't want to have that failing. But I didn't know how to do it. No one explained to me at a young age. I didn't go to Christian school. I didn't hear the words of the commandments as much as the people, as the young people in our Christian school hear it. Okay? So God gave me something, but it, it took a while. That's all right. I think I'm going to stop being personal. Anyone want to add, Ian? I think also when you make that covenant, as we said, you know, God wants us to keep it forever, but you know, we don't because we're sinful people. But He's also given us the tool of forgiveness. Thank goodness in a marriage and in any relationship yeah. that we have with that's people. A, that's a very important comment. I also want to speak to those whose marriage does not exist anymore not because of death, but because of one or the other said, I quit. And I could speak at length of difference between the guilty party and the innocent party in a divorce, but I know that it's often true that the partner that is still faithful at our church and the other churches, and the, the one that left, there is a great sadness and uh, inability to repair what someone else has broken. God knows whether there's fault or not. I can't see that from here. Mm -hmm. Even if I were together with you in the same room doing marriage counseling, I wouldn't know exactly where the fault lies. Plural, faults existed but i would seek re the reconciliation of one to the other with that forgiveness that you talked about mm -hmm. and see if god can repair it i don't repair marriages <laughs> i don't create them either okay well enough personal stuff now another reader if someone hadn't read today i'd like to spread it around um, I'll read. Did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offering? No. Offspring? Godly offspring? Uh -huh. Let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. There's a lot in that passage. Ah. Uh, <laughs> And there's a difficult part, too. Let's look at question 13. In verse 15, how should we teach this vital God-given instruction in our day? What is God's will? What was he seeking? Well, um, it was, um, it said God was seeking um, godly offspring, right? Yes, and uh, whoop, you're one of those, Ian. <laughs> Aren't you? Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be. You're one of the godly offspring uh, of a godly marriage. What a wonderful thing. All right. Now, my parents didn't go to church very regularly. And I used to be very upset about that. But they made sure I got to Sunday school. Oh, that was important. Even when we were traveling. They would find a church and 
find out if they had a Sunday school and they would send me to the Sunday school. And I would take that little leaflet that you get in Sunday school, at least back then you did. And I would take it to my Sunday school teacher and that would count as, that would count toward my perfect attendance. And those little stars got in that teacher's little book and at the end of uh, a quarter, 13 of them, I, I got a little reward. We didn't get those pins that some Sunday schools had back then, but they were little rewards that we would get. Uh, there was an incentive uh, and my parents wanted me to, well, I had at least one parent who was a perfectionist. So that was really important. Now, they may have done it for different kinds of reasons. I, I sure don't know. I never listened to what they said. But I was, instead of being upset with them for not going to church, I thank God that they made sure that I went to Sunday school and then to church. And then when her time came for me to go to catechism classes, they made sure that I got there. I didn't miss one. And I finished it. And I was confirmed. That was important to them. And they were there as witnesses. That was, that was a, that's an indelible and important memory for me. That's what was produced in spite of their sins. They were divorced when I was seven, when I was 13. They were only married 17 years. So here they produced God, godly offspring. And so that's how we should do this instruction in our schools and in our Sunday schools and in the church. And what's God's will to produce more Christians, right? All right, let's go on. Did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? This is that difficult passage. This is a difficult passage, and I'm going to do my best to go back to Genesis 2, 7 where we read the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. Now this ruach, the Hebrew word for breath of life, this breath, I believe is the spirit with a small s or capital S that it Malachi is writing here in chapter 2. But not everyone believes that. If it is true that when you marry a person of the same faith, that he breathes into you the Holy Spirit, well, that is hard to get out of this passage. Remember that in the Old Testament, in the originals, there were no capitals to indicate what kind of spirit only the Greek, only the Hebrew word ruach is there. And you have to interpret it. So that's why it's difficult to tell. Breath equals spirit, the same word. Also the word wind can be translated from that. The same Hebrew word. So you could translate this difficult verse that he gave them a residue or portion of the spirit, the same spirit that is spoken of in Genesis 2, 7, the breath of life. Now, as uh, one of our professors used to say, on here, on this verse interpretation, you can pay your money and take your choice because there's no definite place to land. I told you what I believe it means based on a study that I have done. Well, I think people more literate in the language could probably do a better job, but that's the best I can do. And I hope you'll accept that. So the question I have that's more practical, when God joins a man and woman in marriage, what does he give the partners to share? How then should they treat? Now here, I can't even read it. Can anyone finish that? How should they then treat their marriage? Okay, thank you. I have some things at the bottom of my screen that obliterate the last line. 
Well, how do you answer the question? When God joins a man and woman in marriage, they are sharing at least, at least the gift of life with each other. The gift of being alive together, whether they're Christians or not. And if they have this same breath of God's life, God gives life, we don't. So because you have the ability to marry and breathe the same spirit that Adam and Eve breathed in, well, that was even before Genesis 3. How about that? Well, how should we treat them, our marriage if we have the same breath of life? Treat it with respect because you want to respect the Lord. So you have to respect what he has done for you by giving you part of his spirit. Okay, good. And, and you share the same Holy Spirit if you marry another believer. So you have that, don't you? Okay. All right. That's best I can do. And I want to go on to Genesis 2.24. Uh, Judy, would you read that? I think Judy left. She said she had to go. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. I didn't see her leave. Thank you. Uh, Ian, would you read that? Sure. Uh, Genesis 2.24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Thank you. This is the covenant, as I said before, that God established for marriage. It has not been annulled, amended, or canceled. Got that? God didn't uh, re release any new rules or, or covenants about marriage. You realize that we're going back millennia to the beginning. He created the man, and then he said, it's not good to man to be alone. And he gave her, and he gave a woman to him, and he said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, Isha, because she was taken out of man, Ish. <laughs> and this is the covenant. It's not been annulled, amended, or canceled. No rule and no law and no sin can change that which God intended for our good. Marriage is not a problem. It involves two sinners which make problems for themselves and for each other. So this is a, there's a perfect thing that God gives. When he gives life, it's perfect. When we sin, we, we mess it up. We dirty it. We sully it. But none of those things, no law of any nation, no custom can change that which God intended for our good. Just nail that down and keep it, keep that sacred. When divorces occurred, there is sin, often in both the man and the woman, but this is not an unforgivable sin. I wanna say this with all sincerity to any of you who, whose marriage was dissolved by you or by the other party. I'm not talking about death. But when the marriage has been broken, sometimes a marriage is broken and the couple stays together anyway. That's another subject. But when that divorce of the heart has occurred, the sin that has occurred is not an unforgivable sin. It doesn't mean it's okay, but God forgives sin. And if you are part of the guilt you come to God in repentance. And even though what was broken cannot be easily or ever fixed in some cases, you can't, you can't separate yourself from God out of a, a guilt that stays forever because God forgives sin. I'm going to lighten up here. As, you know, here comes the couple and they come to that place where they're going to make their vows. They're going to face each other. So I tell them to face each other. And they do. And then I say, join your right hands. 
So they, they join the right hands. And here's what I do. I take a little super glue and I put it between their palms. <laughs> he did not. <laughs> That's what I tell them I'm going to do. Now they know I'm kidding, but they get the point. When I'm doing premarital counseling, one of the first questions I asked when I'm interviewing them about uh, their name and address and their phone number and all that stuff we need in order to do the wedding. Uh, one of the things I ask them, now, uh, what are you looking for on your wedding day? Are you looking for a 10-year marriage, a 20-year marriage, a 40-year marriage? Or are, you, are you looking for a 50-year marriage? <laughs> and I try to do it deadpan without joking. You understand why I ask that? Why do well, I ask you? I, well, yeah. you, so you, you said like 30, 40 year, 50 year marriage, right? Yeah. Well, I would answer full life, but I you, you can never promise any of those. You can never promise that you'll live any of those. You don't, you don't, um, you yourself do not know, but uh, you have to um, keep track of your. Um, you mean in cases? To, um, and do you mean in cases yeah, of like death? You, yeah, you could like die before. Yeah, I'm not talking about death, but do you want to stay married? Let's put it that way. Do you want to stay married uh, for 10 years or, or 50 years or 60? And uh, the answer to that is. Oh, like, like, oh, like if we could live? As long as we live. Like, say it like. Oh, all right, all right. You understand. Pastor, but, I'll jump in and make them think a little. <laughs> that's they right. They have to think. That's it's right. not just, you know. You know, love is such a, you know, you have the infatuation stage and then <laughs> it's post infatuation. Yeah. So I'm, I'm running out of time. I thought we'd have plenty of time today, but there is, there is sin and I'm going to have to stop because I've tried to keep to one hour. And my, my clock tells me that I'm about to use that up. What is the next slide, I wonder? Oh, sure, well, that's what you did. Okay. Well, I think that God has a wonderful thing here. And the, the Bible is clear. There are many passages to read. But the main thing that Malachi is saying is once you make that covenant of marriage, that promise, God wants you to keep it, and he is going to help you keep it. And though there is sin in every marriage, there is forgiveness that God has given to you so that you can forgive one another. I'm going to go quickly to the end of chapter 4 of Ephesians. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Lord God, thank you for the gift of marriage, of bringing us together together to talk about your covenant of marriage and reminding us that you made a promise. And your promise is that you will forgive sin for the sake of your son. And meanwhile, what we promise to do is to keep that covenant and to remember Jesus Christ as our Savior who forgives even the sins that we have committed within our various marriages. Repair what can be repaired and what cannot ever be fixed again. Lord, help us to live with peace that you can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. We pray for everyone here and everyone there, whoever listens, that their marriages may be righteous in your sight, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. Where is that?